Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that intro. Um, can everyone hear me fine here? Well, thanks for inviting me to uh, back to DC from San Francisco. Came in yesterday. Um, thanks for inviting me to this great university setting here, University of Maryland. Uh, it reminds me, kind of brings up old memories, where I was an undergrad student at Georgetown. And I'm going to date myself here a little bit, but I was here when Washington, when Ronald Reagan was elected. And uh, the city went from about a 50-year kind of status quo of essentially how politics was running to a shift in the politics that uh, Reagan, the conservative movement, and others kind of started to initiate. Um, it was also a year, 1980, that people forget about this, but the Senate actually flipped to the Republicans for the first time from a long, for a long time, after a long kind of period of the Democrats kind of controlling that. And ultimately, uh, it set up what has been a lot of the politics of the last several decades here. And I think it is something, though, that I'm going to mention here. I think we're coming towards uh, the end of a little bit here, which might be a little controversial. Now, you've had me here. Uh, we're in an academic setting. You want to think about, you're asking me what I think about the future. I'm going to say some things here that might stretch your thinking, challenge you a little bit, maybe be a little bit controversial. But in fact, if I was just coming here to tell you what you already knew or reinforce your own ideas, that wouldn't be much of a talk as it is. So bear with me here. And what I'm going to basically, oh, oh we got to switch over here. Hang on here. I'm going to basically, uh, can everyone see that good from, from the back? The lighting here is fine. I'm going to talk about what is, I'm seeing is a fundamental reinvention of what's happening in America. Uh, and I'm going to tell you essentially what it's going to be is a largely a positive story. I actually see a lot of what's happening now and it's going to happen in the next decade, the next couple decades as really going to end up in a better place. Uh, for basically, it's going to be something that uh, throughout America, but it's also going to have a big impact on cities, which we're going to specifically be talking about through this. Now, this goes against the kind of tenet of the times. I mean, our President Trump kind of came into office uh, really talking about American decline and, and talking to people about uh, how we're not good at other th things anymore and basically a lot of kind of fears of the future. And in fact, folks uh, on the other side of the political divide are now that they're actually thinking, yeah, things are getting pretty bad right now. And so there's been a kind of a sense in, the, in our country that we're really at a, at a crossroads but not doing well. I beg to differ, and I'm going to lay out some of these ideas uh, through the course of this lecture, lecture, and we'll hopefully have a little bit of time at the end to, to uh, talk to you guys. Now, why would you listen to me? What do I have to say? There was a little bit of an introduction there, but I do want to say a few things. I was at the early Wired magazine, and Wired was the first magazine to really grasp um, the implications of this digital revolution, how it really was going to fundamentally change the economy, our society, and in fact have a huge impact even on politics and other things. Uh, and for the last 25 years or so, I've been in, rooted in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. And I've had a succession of startups, uh, including some time in politics, helping from 2004 to 2008, uh, DC kind of transition to politics on the internet. But ultimately, my company now, reInvent, uh, with the last five years, we've really been specializing in bringing high capacity individuals, individuals from different fields, multidisciplinary backgrounds, to kind of apply their thinking on how finding better ways forward, basically figuring out how to solve complex challenges, big challenges facing the country, and through policy, through strategies, really rethink that. I also have hosted for the Three years, a thing called What's Not San Francisco. Every month we go to a different field that's uh, basically going through big changes. Um, you know, robotics, artificial intelligence, you name it, basically biotech. And every take someone from that field to explain what's happening in that field, what's the implications for people outside that field. And through an interview with me and through an inter interaction with the audience, it said she would get a real good sense of all these different fields that are really exploding in innovation. And again, this is something I'm going to try to channel for you today, because what I'm actually able to do over the course of these is to really squeeze down the essence and connect the dots in a lot of these fields that are having a big impact, particularly on cities in the future here. Now, I do get a chance to get out talk around the country, around the, occasionally in Europe and the Asia too, about this, just squeeze down what's really happening here. And I think of it as kind of three-dimensional chess. You can follow something on the surface, you can follow it a little bit long-term in the next, you know, kind of four-year, five-year cycle. But ultimately, what I like to think about is at a bigger strategic kind of grand strategy level. And we're going to talk big picture here, and I think it's a way that opens up what's really happening. Now, two minutes things actually right now are focused on tweet time or what's happening on cable news cycle and uh, and it's, it's we've kind of been like 
out of the blue, we're kind of like, what happened to our politics? You know, we, okay, where did Trump come from? Even from the Republican side, the Democratic side, that was not something anyone was thinking about. But there's also been reaction on the other side, and here's the kind of whole thing going on with the uh, young people in the streets here. There's real concern about mass migration in the Middle East, kind of going into Europe. There's worries about kind of immigration coming across borders. There's like the rise of China. And all, you know, what's happening with the economic power of that place? What's happening with kind of autonomous vehicles? Big impact. I know you're even wrestling with that here to figure that out. There's climate change. We're getting floods. And kind of, we haven't seen the kind of the hurricanes of this last season down in the Gulf. We're getting crazy fires out in San Francisco. We're watching inequality soar to all these heights, particularly around the West Coast now. Crazy kind of amounts of homeless. And all these things are kind of make people feel kind of chaotic, it feels like confusing, it feels depressing, at least people are really perplexed and, 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 and confused, frustrated. And I'm here to say that these are all signs of bigger changes going on here, but in fact they're signs weirdly of things that are very positive, moving in a new direction. It's just that it's breaking up an old system and moving us to a new place. Now the way to kind of do this, and this is what I do when I do speak to audiences around the country and the world here, particularly kind of senior execs and stuff, I like to actually get people to pull back, you know, pull back from the craziness of kind of what's happening on the ground, pull back into kind of what's going on in the city, what's going on in the region, what's going on in your country, what's going on in the world. And I also like to get people to start thinking more about time. Pull back from what's happening and think, what would people in 50, 100, 500 years from now, what are they going to think about happening in the early 21st century? And when you do that little exercise, you realize that all the craziness that's kind of absorbing us day to day just falls to the wayside. And the real essence of what's important around, happening around us really becomes much, much more clear. And if you take that perspective, you basically are seeing that we are in a very rare and a cra uh, kind of extraordinary moment. It's a really a kind of, I would call it a world historic transformation, and certainly in the terms of the United States, since we're in America here, we're in a rare kind of period of what's happened in America about, I would say about four times before. What's happened essentially over the course of periodically in history is you get some big changes to the deep structural changes of new technologies, new ways of work, the new way the economy kind of works, that break up the old way of doing things and make the old ways not adequate to solve things up against unprecedented challenges that we, the old ways just don't know how to wrap their heads around. They don't know how to deal with. And then what happens is our country goes through about a 10 to 20 year period of reinvention, which is a reinvention not just in our politics, our society, our economy, how do we do work, all kinds of things just explode in innovation. We reboot essentially a new system that tends to work for about the next 50 years or so. Now, when you think about it in terms of historical terms, can people over here, by the way, am I standing in the way? You can see it okay? One way to think of American history is there was about a 50-year period, essentially, when new technologies around agricultural technologies came in and essentially reorganized the economy around a different way of doing agriculture, from a slave economy basically into kind of the uh, cotton gin, for example, right at the cusp there of 1800, um, and essentially changed the way the economy went uh, in a very fundamental way, the way we actually did work. There was a whole other set of things in the, about the middle of the century there, the early industrial period, where we kind of harnessed steam, we started to actually understand early manufacturing, and we kind of restructured the economy and the way society worked in America for that 50 years. We also saw kind of then the early part of the uh, 20th century with uh, electricity, we were able to build up with steel and people poured into the big cities. We saw a whole other way to organize. Now we're organizing the economy, we're, we're reorganizing our society in every one of these things. And fundamentally our politics and our society kind of went right along with these economic changes. Then right after the war we saw another set of technologies and the kind of opening up of the kind of transportation through internal combustion engines and the freeway systems and the suburbia that kind of built up. Part of what this region right here was kind of born out of that period. And ultimately, we come to today, and we are in another one of these fundamental transitions. We are in a period now where the fundamental technologies, the fundamentals of the economy, and the fundamentals of our society are going through a really fundamental rework. Now, what is so different about what's going on right now in our, in our world? Well, if you take that perspective 50, 100, 500 years from now, we are going through the biggest technological change. It'll be remembered literally in 500 years as when the world went digital. Because once everything goes digital, you can actually 
rework everything in a kind of networked environment. And so it blows apart the past ways of bureaucratic, hierarchical kind of ways of doing things and starts to rework it in a very fundamental way. All these other ways of doing things. But that's just one piece. The other thing is we're essentially, for the first time in the history of the planet, connecting the globalization of everything is kind of moving to organization at a planetary scale. This is, you know, we've never done this. Humans have never really organized at that kind of level. And of course, all our institutions, all our kind of norms are coming under extreme strain in this situation. And we're coming up against our own unprecedented challenges, not the least of which is climate change, which we're going to talk about. But, you know, it's climate change, but related things. We've got, gosh, you know, water shortages. We just came a huge drought in San Francisco. Pandemics, this Ebola things are starting to come up. Mass migration, kind of particularly from climate change. Terrorism is still a problem. Nuclear proliferation we're still wrestling with, just literally in the news right now, huh? Rising inequality that's kind of out of, uh, really out of the norms of the last 50 years. Our old systems are breaking down. Healthcare is not working. Education not working the way it was. We haven't, we're trying to kind of break, the old things are breaking down, but the new things haven't quite taken hold. And so whether we like it or not, we are in a fundamental moment of reinvention. If you don't like, you know, we're, whether you like it or not, we are in this period. And we are essentially going from a time where many people I can see, or maybe not the students here, but a lot of us like my age, you know, we were born in a, pre-digital analog thing and we've essentially transitioned to a completely digital era. We've actually gone from an era organized around nation states and kind of stable borders of things to essentially a totally interconnected, interconnected global world. And we're going, we're just beginning this move from essentially carbon-based energy to inevitably of the course of the coming decades here in this century into a, a, a clean energy kind of future. And in short, we're essentially going from a 20th century world the 21st century. And I chose basically cities for both of that because cities are going to play a huge part, as they did before, but they're playing it again in terms of where the hub, the actually real deep energy of this transformation happening. When I say cities, by the way, I totally include this area, is it? You guys are in this kind of realm of DC. Uh, more than anyone I think is really calculating is America is reshaping and reconfiguring into essentially uber cities, I would argue. Uh, which is one of the things that's happening about the affordable housing crunch and the homeless problem is we're in the early stages of essentially a redesign of how the country works and where the people live. And it's particularly it's driven also by generational change. Anyhow, getting ahead of the story here, I'm going to basically move through a lot of material here, but I'm going to break this into six things. We're going to move through it as fast as we can. But a part of the fun here is to kind of connect the dots on things. One thing I want to talk about is I'm coming from Silicon Valley. Believe me, there's a lot more of this digital revolution to come. We want to talk a little bit about that, how much more juice is in that kind of transformation. I want to talk about the global implications of this. I'm very bullish on this, I'm very positive. And I think there's going to be a lot more economic growth to come. We're going to talk a little bit about the city of uh, the future of work, but uh, also around the cities, how cities are going to be the hub of this future. And again, you are definitely part of that equation. We're going to then talk briefly about uh, demographic changes particularly generational changes, which are in full swing here. You can't talk about the future without talking about the shift, uh, climate change and the shift, the sustainable shift we got here. And ultimately, all this is going to be surfacing in our politics. You can't go through these kind of enormous changes, these sub fundamental changes, without seeing this get worked out in our politics. And that's exactly what we're in the middle of. And I think I'm just going to give an interpretation to our current politics that might strike people different, but I think it actually makes more sense than uh, our current way of analyzing what the heck's going on here. Um, so anyhow, back, let's start with the digital stuff. There is a key thing, now many of you might have heard about this, but it's worth reminding ourselves that the core thing driving the revo digital revolution at its essence is essentially there is a thing called Moore's Law, you can say here, that engineers have been able to essentially get twice as many integrated circuits on a chip which essentially was shrunk the size of the chips, doubled their power, doubled the power, and dropped the price. Now when you do doublings in the early days, this has been happening for 40 years, in the early days of doubling, those are doubling, but they don't get, it gets more interesting at the back end. And then that goes, boom, up a, up a whole floor. And then it goes up two floors, and then it goes up four floors, and then it goes up, you know, eight floors. The back ends of doublings get crazy kind of differences. We're 40 years into that around computers. So basically what happened is, you can, so those of you can remember, this is essentially the first 
personal computer that one megahertz, which is how you measure power in a, in a computer, costs five grand. Five grand a megahertz. Now if you basically take a, a current Dell roughly, it's 4,000 megahertz for less than a thousand bucks. So it's essentially 21 cents a megahertz from 5,000. So essentially what you've got is computers that have gotten 25,000 times more powerful in that period. Now that's one way is power that measure that way. Another way is clock speed, how fast computers are. If you take the fastest computers in that period of the, when the PC first came out, supercomputers were essentially working at 200 megaflops, which is how you kind of measure those things. It costs 31 million bucks. Today, basically, an iPhone <laughs> is 300 gigaflops, not megaflops. Add three more zeros to that, and it's less than a thousand bucks. So basically, everybody out there is walking around with a $31 million supercomputer. So just remember that, folks. A uh, crazy thing to keep in mind. The drop of size. Remember I told you about size. It used to fill a room, and that's how it went. I mean, you've watched this in your lifetimes if you've been as old as me. Now, essentially, the earbuds Apple earbuds have computers in them now, right? I mean, it's just getting crazy how small these things, every hotel room now has a little chip in it, right? I mean, things are just getting super small and super powerful. Price. Here's an example of price. You go back to 1980, and one gigabyte cost $700,000 storage. Just think about that. Today, you see a gigabyte costs four cents. Four cents. Can you see that change? Boom, in your lifetime. Well, of course, it's a crazy a drop of price, which is why everything's now going to big data. So then you go to big data. Think about big data. If you take, essentially, all the information that humans have done since we were banging on stones 10,000 years ago, right? And you go all the way to 2003, we human beings collectively created five exabytes of data. That's like gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, you know, X, but we're starting to, you're, you're not, it's just keep adding three zeros every time you move up a notch here. We are now creating five exabytes every two days. So it took us 10,000 years and now we're doing it every two days. And now essentially the world's information is doubling every two years. We're on that same hockey stick that I was talking about, the doubling thing, right? So this gives you the core dynamics that's behind what's been so disruptive so far. And there's more to come here, folks. I mean, all these things are starting to come. You're starting to see autonomous vehicles. You're watching drones. That's really serious stuff about how things are going to get delivered. We're talking hyperloops now, connecting up uh, our areas, and essentially virtuality, things like this. This is all the stuff that's now starting to permeate our lives now. But it's coming, and of course, the big one to come, uh, which is artificial intelli intelligence and advanced robotics, and we're going to talk a little bit about that now. So anyhow, the point is, boom, these things are getting increasingly powerful and ultimately uh, some amazing things. The second thing that's crazy about this digital revolution is connecting up of everything. And so that, you think about a similar kind of exponential growth in the internet, which is basically, think about it this way, there's a thing called Metcalf, which you squeeze it down to its essence. Essentially it means if one person invites two people in a network, say your first two friends into Facebook, how hard is that? And those two people say, huh, okay, I can invite two people, and they invite two people in, boom. They've only invited two, but the network has doubled. That's exponential, right? And those four, yeah, well, actually, we can invite two. Boom, the network doubles again, right? And then boom, the network doubles again. And then the next one goes out to the wall, and then it goes out to the street. You know, the same thing we were doing about the hockey stick. This is why something like Facebook can go from nobody to a billion people in like seven years, right? This is going through all the networks. Basically, the network effect of all kinds of things. And so what's happened essentially with the internet kind of coming to being in the early 90s here, we've watched two booms. We've watched a low bandwidth boom where anything that was digital could get sucked in was sucked in. Basically, text and photos. Then there was a build out. There's a little crash there as we kind of built out capacity. And then everything got bigger files. Music first, television first, a second, and now ultimately... Uh, movies are starting to actually go or are gone. So that whole system essentially took 20 years to suck everything into the internet. We started this process with 6% of the world's, uh, of the Amer Americas and the world's uh, data digital. 6%, now it's 100% digital and it's only going to go up. So then you think, okay, big picture. Um, people online. Now this is not that long ago. 2000, it's not even 20 years ago, only North, of North America was on the internet, right? And you go to some of these places like the Middle East, basically nobody was on, right? Then you go two, 10 years later, boom, 
That's how it went. We've since got up to 80% here. And then you watch, you know, the Middle East and things like that. It's like, ah, interesting. This is like the, 30, the same 30% we were at, right? Boom, you watch the whole Middle East go up with everyone on the, these young people on their smartphones, right? Well, there's still a lot of space over that, folks. We don't have the new numbers, honestly, because these come up every de decade, right? But there's still white space out there. But we do know right now that 40% of the world is online right now. But we know that 75% of the world has a cell phone, which is crazy. 20 years ago, most people in this room didn't have a cell phone, right? Now the goat herd in Africa has a cell phone, right? Well, we know what happens once you get that. Well, ultimately, everybody's going to get it. I mean, except some totally remote places. And then on the backs of a basic voice line, you're going to get rudimentary email, just like we know how that works. And on the backs of that infrastructure, you're going to build out 4G, and ultimately we're on 4, 5G already. And essentially, within less than 10 years, the entire planet will be connected by whole high bandwidth connections with $3 billion supercomputers. And everybody will have it. Boom and video and everything else around. It's a crazy world, and that's inevitable, essentially. So the inevitable part, I want to say, the final little thing is just to keep in mind of how these things work, is essentially paradigm shifts, another kind of way people think about in, in the valley. Um, basically, all technologies go through this, uh, the success is essentially you get this period where you have the innovators, people like me, who buy things for an outrageous amount of money, and my wife gets all pissed off at me, and it's like, oh my god, why did we spend all that money on that flat panel TV? But whatever, we're going to do it. Then some of the early adopters say, wow, that is so cool, I want to do that. Then the guy on the block, some of the early majority start coming in and say, oh, I'm going to get that damn thing. Ultimately, the costs come down, and the late majority start going into it. And finally, you get the laggards who, you know, they want a black and white television set, but you just can't even buy them anymore. So it's like, what do I do? Uh, the key is always the tipping point. And this is essentially what the job is in a lot of people in the valley, is figuring out where are we there, and which ones are not going to go, and they're going to fall down, and which ones are going to go over the hump. So that's one thing, technology adoption. The second thing is the systems have to get restructured around these new technologies. And this is the biggest part. And this is essentially you're in it with city planning, is you know the old system will have a lot of staying power. And you get a new technology that says, oh, this is a new way of doing things. Let's say, hey, we can do this taxi thing with the phone, you know, and get these other drivers to find us. Few people try, and it's interesting. It takes a little bit more critical mass, and people say, holy crap, this works. And then all of a sudden, there goes the taxi industry, right? That's what happens on these things. They happen fast. And so the key is you got to understand when this is happening. Autonomous vehicles, all kinds of stuff is now right around the corner. When is the real shift going to go fast? electric vehicles, things like that. Okay, so there's a little tech, there's a tech world now. Now I'm going to shift to quickly to global thing. We have a lot of pieces here, and then by the end we'll have them all connected. This idea of the globalization of everything. The first thing is the non-tech piece of it, since you're urban planners, city planners and things. You've got to understand the movement of bodies on the planet right now is crazy how many people are moving now. This is Here's a good example. We didn't have commercial aviation until coming off World War II. We are now at three, what is it there? 3.3 billion plane rides a year right now. Now there's only seven and a half billion people on the planet, right? Now a few of us are doing more than one. I'm sure most people here are, but still, it's a crazy number of flights. But then you take tour, travel and tourism. 10% of the global economy now is travel and tourism. So if you think about your development here in this area, you know, this is a major, major source of the economy now. In fact, it's bigger than the entire global oil revenues, if you want to think of it that way, right? Uh, here is essentially tourism. Just take not the business side of things, but just tourism. This again, from the same time we started watching this happen. This is broken down by region, by the way. Look at where we are here, folks. We are essentially to 2010. That's the line. It's just been this inexorable growing. But look where it's expected to go by 2030. It's like it's not slowing down. More bodies, more people running around the planet. Boom. So there is this whole thing going on about the integration of the planet that is making a different, very different world. And also think about how you take advantage of that trend. Meanwhile, back to tech. Because I was talking about the tech from the technology point of view. This is the market, uh, this is the value of essentially of Apple Computer. When they started essentially flatline, and it was only, but they had a vision. 
Jobs had this vision of what these things were ultimately going to do. So we'll look at where it starts picking up. 2005, when was that started to happen? That was around the iPhone, right? Uh, and then boom, 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 boom. Now it's a valuable company in the world. But it's not just Apple. If you go back to the 20th century, 2000, when I showed you where only 30% of Americans had, was on the internet, these were the five most valuable companies in the, in the, in the economy. One was a, tech, was, a, was a tech company, Microsoft there, but it essentially was a 20th century economy. Manufacturing, oil, financial services, retail. That was the commanding heights of the economy. Five years later, had to do with the oil boom, but it was, uh, or no, it was roughly the same, shuffled around a little bit. The next actually time, actually Apple's now in the pack, displaces Microsoft, but now it's all oil companies. And in 2016, what commanding heights of the global economy? Every single one a technology company, all of them on the West Coast, and three of them in Silicon Valley and two in Seattle. The biggest, most powerful companies in the world basically dominating the econ economy. Some of them didn't exist. Most of them didn't exist 20 years ago. That what's happened. Why? Because they're all platforms. They're all tech platforms. And tech platforms have a dynamic that once you become the social network that everybody, you can find everybody, there's all this incentive for everyone to be on that platform and it's really hard to get anyone to start another platform. And so anyhow, there is something there and there's a whole adjustment to that that we gotta be rethinking now. But it's something about, it's a crazy thing that happened. One of the reasons of this dynamic is it's all global. Remember I talked about the global piece of this? This is the population of the United States. These are the unique users using uh, YouTube, Google, unique Google searches, and Facebook in any given month right now, roughly. It's a little bit, actually it's more than that now. Facebook's about to two billion. So it's clearly not an American phenom. This is where these companies, essentially all their growth is abroad. And this is where it gets down to this thing about, you know, everyone talks, you know, we heard in the last campaign, you know, America is, doesn't do anything good anymore. It's like, oh, we, we fail in everything. That is complete garbage. Complete garbage. Completely misunderstanding what's going on. You take every single innovative field right now, and American companies are totally on top of it, if not very much in the pack of all this stuff. Silicon Valley, there's nothing remotely comparable anywhere on the planet to Silicon Valley. How? Nothing like it. Wall Street, some competition. Biotech. Well, biotech's a little bit in Europe. Aerospace, nothing like it. Military, nothing. Higher education, no one's going to China for higher education, right? I mean, healthcare, advanced healthcare. Anyhow, this is just what people got to wrap their heads around. Yes, we're, Americans are very innovative. We're still innovative, but we're now in a global economy. And essentially, the amount of wealth that's being generated is just spectacular. This is why, when you take the income of the upper 1%, essentially, we're back to the days from the early 20th century when the technology of that time were essentially crazy build, to essentially we're back in those days now, in terms of the percentage of income uh, shared by the, uh, take, uh, by the upper 1%, including a lot of tech folks, but not just that. Anybody in that commanding heights kind of space. One of the reasons that dip, by the way, folks, is just interesting to overlay, that's the tax on the upper 1% that in the 50s was as high as 91% coming off the war. Essentially drove that equality down differently and then again, see it readjusted in the 80s here. Essentially it's about flatlined for the last few decades here and again it's come back up. Now it's not the only reason but essentially it's something to think about. Here's another way to look at this and again I think uh, the inequality index is fascinating. This is wealth, assets essentially, it's not income. And you, again you watch a thing where it's about through the, till the 30s here, 50-50, this is the upper 1%, how much they own, and that's the other 90%. There's still 9% in there, but let's set them aside. It's the 1% and the 90%. Since there was an equality period till about the 80s, and now it's reversed, and essentially they're equal right now, and again, causing a lot of problems. Now, my first book was called The Long Boom, and I want to talk about this economic thing briefly here, because it's a really important thing to understand going forward. Two things drive long booms, long driving economic booms. New technologies which create new industries and more and more integration so you can kind of do more things globally or in markets basically faster and more. And if you take the great boom of the post-war, we essentially took all these technologies developed in the war, computers, atomic energy, commercial aviation, all that stuff, went from the army basically into the private sector, public sector. Second thing is we took half the world, the free world, 
put them on one half of an economy, half the world economy, and we start going gangbusters. America opened to new things, into new technologies. We boom in the 50s. By the 60s, the West, Japan, all booming. And it was only with the oil shocks, the lifeblood of that industrial economy, that we basically lost about after the 30-year run of the boom. But here's what people don't really realize. We came off the Cold War, and all these technologies we're talking about here, computer chips were done for, were designed for guided missiles, right? Uh, the internet was how to communicate in nuclear war. Uh, you know, all these things, we're watching all these maps you're getting from Google satellites, it was all to spy the Russians. Anyhow, we take all that, we put it in the private sector, and everyone can use it, and then we take the whole world, not just the free world, but communist China, post-communist China, communist Russia, boom. The free world all goes into, ba or the whole world's on one economy. America, again, we adapt early, we jump on this stuff. We're booming in the 90s. By the 2000s, the whole world's booming, Turkey, Brazil, everybody. And uh, ultimately, it's the financial blood of our time. The shocks of the uh, finance century brought that whole thing down. Now, the reason I'm saying that, so it's a very parallel thing. I'm saying we're going to move, we're moving into another one here. We're moving in with different sets of clean technologies, biotechnologies, nanotechnologies, a very different thing of uh, manufacturing at atomic level, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so there's plenty more growth here to come. In fact, what we might think about is there was a bunch of technologies that had to get absorbed coming off the war, a bunch of now we're in the end game of the computer internet, and ultimately got another role coming here. Now, one little quickie here, China. Because it is huge. This, by the way, I was a foreign correspondent in China. In fact, I spent some time in a Chinese jail around Tiananmen Square. This didn't exist when I was, this is uh, off the tip of Shanghai. Uh, that was all happened in the last 30 years. It's a crazy thing. Now, and I just want to put in, in, for people to kind of wrap their heads around China. If you take the next tier down, the next five valuable companies in the world right now, that is Chinese, Alibaba and Tencent, is that both tech companies and then the other ones, again, are non-tech companies. They're still hanging by their fingernails there. But um, it's a different world. Middle class, Chinese middle class, the people that are going to come visiting, all these tourists, uh, only 12% in 2009 were in the middle class. They're expecting, this is their projection, might be a little, um, but they'll all be middle class, many by 2030. And if you take the entire developing world, this is the world population going out to 2030, that's the rise of the middle class. Increasingly, the world is pulling out of poverty, many, many, many more middle class folks. Again, think about that world differently. Shift quickly here to the future of work and your cities. I took your little idyllic city here that you guys are trying to build, which I think would be great. When I say city again, I just think of it in the eyes or suburbanized areas. Um, I want to throw a few things in here that you've got to wrap your head around for planning. One is a third of all Americans are not in regular jobs. They're essentially independent contractors, gig workers, all these folks. There's a very different workforce that's emerging here. That same group is coming from multiple sources of uh, income all this time. Uh, the technology, which always leads, always leads to more productivity. Essentially, when the internet came in and the computer chips, American productivity went up. What's different is the distribution of money that came off that is forked, basically. Again, starting about the 80s. It has something to do, again, you can think about it around policy or whatever. There's a bunch of things around that. But that's one of the things that's the problem here. This is going to get better or worse, depending how you explain it, but um, with AI. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of studies there and a lot of anxiety around this, but essentially you can, this is a pretty decent projection from McKinsey that by 2030, about 30% of all American jobs will maybe not go away from automation, but will be fundamentally changed because of automation. And the way to think about this is it's not just manual jobs anymore, it's brain jobs. That's why if, you know, medical technicians, uh, AI is going to do that. Le lawyers, frankly, there's going to be a lot of lawyers that are going to be done by robots. Uh, anyhow, there's a big thing happening here that's going to kind of change the way we do things. The way to wrap your head around this, and again, for city planners, be thinking about this. Since the 80s, routine jobs of the brain, the same thing in your brain over and over, or routine jobs with your hands over and over, have flatlined. No new jobs in that. All new jobs have come basically out of creative jobs, using your brain, or non-routine jobs using your hands, like a barista or something. Can't, a robot's not going to be able to pull off all the you know, crazy 
person who wants their latte a certain way, you know? I mean, whatever. Uh, this is only going to get worse. Because with AI is essentially, now it's on steroids and advanced robotics. So you've got to start thinking about how do you deal with that, that world. My feeling about this is that we're going to come to a really nice rethink of what humans do well, what computers do well, and robotics do well, and it's going to work out. But it's something to actually, I wouldn't totally, uh, it's got a long way to go to figure this out. Now, one other trend I want to do with cities is I think you guys should be thinking about is video paradigm shift. And when you introduced me, you talked a lot about how deeply my companies have been involved in video. I've been very bullish on this for a while. And I do want to just show you this key thing. But this is a good one to watch. You take that same period from 1990, the last 20 years, and this is traffic on the backbone of the internet. But essentially, when you start in the 90, the web was nothing. By the middle of 2000, it was half of all traffic. And then you get this blue world video that starts popping up about 2005 when the bandwidth got big enough. By 2010, half of all traffic on the internet was video. That is now out to about, what is it now? 63% roughly, and now it's projected by 2020 to be about 85. If you aren't thinking video, uh, then you're not really where the action is in the internet right now. I would just say in terms of, and, and this is connecting cities and connecting work up, we kind of saw this early Skype period, is it kind of the early adopters, we're kind of in the group video period now, it's starting to hit in that next sector right here. And everything you can do now, all work gets done by meetings with no more than 10 people, looking at each other, calming each other down, negotiating, kind of whatever it is, group hug kind of stuff, and uh, working on common documents. And increasingly this is now able to routinely be done. Biggest generation in American history, bigger than the baby boomers. These are all some of the famous folks that you'll recognize in that generation uh, in all kinds of different fields. But again, in planning, maybe you guys have got your heads wrapped around this, but I'm astounded how many people haven't really wrapped their heads around this, the business groups. This is essentially the population of the United States uh, right now, or roughly right now, uh, with every year, every one of those is a year. And the higher up you go, the, it's the numbers of them. If you basically take the key ages 20 to 60, which is where the guts of the economy is essentially, and all your consumers are, essentially the millennials now, this is the generation born, in, let's say 81 to 97, there's a little dispute on where you end and begin. They're all adults, they're all 18 or above, and they're basically in the early, uh, kind of mid 30s now. That is the biggest generation, and they are now all in the workforce, and they're all voting, right? The boomers, previously the biggest, are actually retiring and in fact, they're passing away. You know, folks are, that's what happens when you get older, right? And uh, this is now. You push that out 10 years, less than 10 years actually, I just put, I put it to 2025 and look at what's going to happen. Essentially, the boomers are completely off the 60s thing, millennials are totally dominant, Gen X in the middle there, and basically the people, again, the generation be behind them are not as big. If you're planning for the future, you got to plan for the millennials. That is the game. Now, if you're globally, what's crazy, it's even crazier. This is the global generational thing. It is a millennial world now, and the boomers don't really matter in the global kind of generations thing. And ultimately, you push that out, the same thing. It's just, it, now, on the other hand, the younger generation behind them globally is a bigger deal. Now, if you take our American crew, the reason this is important is are very different. I mean, people have talked a ton about this, but I will just point out quickly, we know they're tech savvy, super collaborative, they work very differently than anybody, civic-minded, in a way that actually the previous generation were more cynical, racially diverse, 45%, 40 to 45% different races, totally global, much more exposure abroad, uh, completely green. Even if you have any issues around whether there's climate change, there's no debate in that generation, basically. If you go to the Boomer generation, which was still kind of running things, or just at the tail end of it, essentially. Media savvy rather than tech. Very individualistic, not collaborative. Wanted their own McMansions, you know, uh, all by themselves, right? I would say indulgent. I'm the back into that generation. But they were not, they didn't want, they didn't want to invest in the future, put it that way. Um, largely white because of immigration policies uh, that they were not, that just they inherited. Very nationalistic not very exposed globally, uh, and ultimately, I would call them principled, which is another way to call them stubborn, which is why our politics can't get beyond this kind of constant fight we've been having since the 60s, because it's a basically a 50-50 split in the boomer generation around politics. Um, the thing from a planner point of view is, you know, we saw how the big boomers 
into childhood, Disneyland and all that stuff, reinvented young adults, rock and roll and all that stuff, midlife, the McMansion thing, give me my house in the suburbs, and aging, they're reinventing it, you know, as they retire here. But what we haven't thought through is the millennial version of that. Because millennials completely did a different childhood. And right now they're remaking young adulthood. They're moving back to the cities. The boomers fled the cities. When I was a young kid, it's like the inner cities were abandoned, right? Now it's like you can't get an apartment in San Francisco. It's like insane, right? Uh, very different thinking. They're going to have children differently, probably in those cities, close to cities. They're going to probably live another 20 years because of all genetics, medical devices, all the things we know. Uh, and ultimately, uh, they're going to basically spend the entire century and they're going to drive the majority of decisions. Any, we're in this handoff now, folks, between these two mega generations. And if you don't, yeah, it's, that's theoretically, you can see that, but it's also in the numbers. This is already, this is nationally. Only 6% of the workforce in 2000 was millennial. That shifted to 15%. You see the boomers started fading in about 2010, came down, and now millennials are the biggest number of folks in the workforce, and the boomers are essentially 50-50. And thank God for you Gen X folks that are holding the boat as it kind of went from doom, 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 you know, <laughs> keeping it from tipping. Um, but, uh, but here's the point, folks. 10,000 boomers are retiring every single day in this country. Don't plan for the boomers. Plan for millennials. Um, those millennials, by the way, very much more diverse. I just want to throw a few things out here. This is essentially the population growth in the United States of 2050, and that is those with Hispanic origin. We're going to have 30% of the entire country is going to be of Hispanic origin. If you took this span, 1980 to 2050, and moved it back a century to 1880 to 1950, so many of the immigration in the early 20th century was just totally fraught and race riots. And you know, look at DiCaprio's, you know, uh, the streets of New York, whatever the hell it was. Uh, but anyhow, by the end of that period, we had you know an Irish Catholic president heartthrob in Sinatra and others. I mean, there's that integration that's going to be happening that I think Americans are having a hard time wrapping their heads around. I also, if you take not just Hispanic, you take this is people of color, essentially races beside white, growth from the 60s, as a percentage it brought the white percentage down. That's the America that elected Barack Obama. These are the conservative projections from the Census Bureau. This isn't illegal immigration. This is essentially where the country's going probably by 2044. Whites will be a minority of the whole country. That is California today, right now. Uh, that is, in fact, the first state to really pop into that way. All right, we're going to get out of that quickly here. We're going to do one last little touch here. I don't know where you folks, uh, I'm assuming, are kind of more into this space. About a lot of business groups, I have to spend a lot of time on this. But I'll just give you some of the quick things on this. The facts are indisputable. Since we've been basically measuring global temperatures accurately since 1880s, essentially that's the rise in temperature. It's only at all the kind of hottest days have come in the last, since the 20th, uh, 21st century here, and it's getting worse by the, by the time. Now, here's the problem. If you go back 2,000 years, CO2 in the atmosphere, we can know this from ice kind of cores and stuff. It's been flat until, boom, the Industrial Revolution. Now it's through the roof. We're past the danger zone of 350 parts per million. We're into 400, and that trend looks bad. It's going up. If you really want to take a big picture, you can go back 400,000 years. This is before Homo sapiens was around, right? And uh, you can see this is in the atmosphere, going up and down. And essentially, boom, this was the 1950s, and that's where we are. We're going back to like the dinosaur time, right? You know, or pre-humans about what the planet's like. So it's not a question of the numbers. This is happening. Um, the only thing is, I be stated on my positive side here, we're also watching an incredible technology story happening here. Uh, for some of the same reasons, you know, solar chips, for example, are very similar to uh, the manufacturing process for computer chips. If you take literally uh, the fall in dollars of um, solar energy, 76 bucks a watt in 77 is boom, it's now about 74 cents a watt. Yeah, 74 dot, yeah, that's right. If that's 76 dollars, that's 74 cents. That's the coming down of prices. If you look 
At other prices with comparable energy sources, this is solar, boom, it's going to be cheaper than coal. Basically, it's on track here in about the 2020s. We've got a lot of things to be talking positively about. We're watching the ramping up of solar energy, particularly in the kind of sunny states. And I will say for you folks, it's not just about clean energy transition. This is a fantastic book by a guy I know quite well, Paul Hawken. I do want to just mention from a city planning point of view, this is all the ways you can actually pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So you can buy shifting energy, but there's a lot here that you can do to reorganize cities, buildings, transportation, actually how you treat globally women and girls, uh, it doesn't have as much probably application here, but anyhow the point, there's a lot of uh, materials shifts that you can do, there's a lot to be done if you want more on that, definitely uh, check out that book. But I will say this, think about this as a strategic moment. It's like if we take this seriously, we're going to have to revamp the energy grid, the transportation system the kind of urban footprint. We're going to have to get more efficient housing. We're going to have to sustainable agriculture and food. We're going to have to get more adaptable. These are huge growth opportunities, all kinds of opportunities to kind of rework our cities. Which brings me to the final point here about the reinvention of America, the politics piece. And um, there's no way we're going to go through this kind of thing without seeing the surface in politics. And if you go back to those five, those four periods I talked about before, every single one of these things had profound political change associated with it. In fact, if you go back to that agricultural revolution, it was Tom, the rise of Thomas Jefferson and a kind of yeoman farmer and a kind of decentralized way we did our politics and the economy. You look around that mid-century, around the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, but there's a whole land-grant universities, which is, this is one of them, uh, the Homestead Act, I mean, opening up the West with the Transcontinental Railroad, tons of innovation happened to kind of rework what America was like for the next 50 years. We watched the whole thing around the progressive era, around the turn of the century, when people were streaming to cities, we revamped everything, gave women the vote, you know, income tax, all the stuff that actually reshifted how we we're going to deal with that. And ultimately, the last time we went through this, Great Depression, World War II is essentially the, the New Deal and essentially the post-war boom. I'm saying we're in one of those now, folks. And I would say it started just from the era's point of view, certainly unfinished business, but Obama, I think, was closer to where we're going to go. Again, I don't want to get too much into politics here, but I, there is one thing I would say, the themes I've been talking about, he made a huge effort to move the, world, move the government into more a digital kind of world who's trying to revamp a foreign policy that is much more globally integrated and less on kind of war for, for, for a war-like kind of way of going. And essentially, he was, got us in the climate accords and others that was trying to actually move the sustainable thing. Yet, a lot of that's getting out wild. And again, I don't want to get into the partisan side of this, except I would say there is a classic response to this kind of change is what I, I would say Trump is representing, which is, no, we're not going to go there. We're going to make America great again. We're going to go back to coal. We're going to open up oil on the, you know, on the coastlines. I mean, you know what? We're going to roll back all the accords. We're going to get out of the climate change. We're, oh, the, everything. That's not forward motion. That's backward motion. Uh, and again, maybe there's room to debate that we can talk about this. But I will say this. The country essentially is going to be hard pressed to go that direction. I showed you the numbers on the millennials. Overwhelmingly moving this other direction. We've watched all the kind of trauma around immigration, huge numbers. I said 30% of the country is going to be Hispanics. This is going to, the wall stuff is going to resonate for a long time to come. Climate change, there's a huge alienation going on. People who are thinking, and in fact, uh, in terms of the facts about this stuff, and again, you can just see from the 40s, the rise of college educated folks, education levels just going up and up and up. And so anyhow, I will say what we're experiencing now is a pause in this transition, a moment of kind of paralysis, you could say. But we're going to go forward. And I want to just say, this might be my more, most controversial thing here. But I want to say it anyhow, and I think it's just worth thinking about, because this is what I actually think is happening. And if you kind of believe me this far, you might as well hear my last bit here. <laughs> I think what's happening in California is the, around politics is the closest thing to where America is going in its future. And there's a whole thing I've done around this. I've done a whole TED talk on this and other things about California's future outside this. And let me put it to you this way. Um, 
California experiences the future earlier than a lot of places in the country. And essentially, they adapt very quickly because they're very innovative and they kind of try things. They like to try new things out. This is not just a progressive blue state thing. It's like they were, they, they invented Ronald Reagan, right? I mean, they invited the conservative backlash. They did the anti-tax thing. They've been through the immigration backlash. That was a kind of a period. And in fact, it took the country about 15 year time delay uh, for a long time. Same thing with what the paralyzed country now can't pass anything. We were there 15 years ago. Like, we couldn't pass anything. We were the joke of all the countries. Because one side couldn't agree with the other side, we just couldn't get anything done. It was a total mess. We were a complete an utter mess as a state. And started to shift though in 2005. And what has happened, now everyone says, oh, California's such a blue state. It was not a blue state. It was a red state, and then it was a purple state, and now it's a blue state. And there's something really big going on there, particularly around climate change. All these themes I've been talking about, is it really happening in a big way? And the next generation of leaders that you're starting to see emerging here, this is probably going to be the next governor, Gavin Newsom, and Kamala is the new uh, young um, senator, is probably going to run for president. There's a whole other mindset that's taking this a whole other level. And again, I don't, again, I don't want to push this politics on you, but I think you'd be smart to keep an eye on what's happening out there, because I think there's this adaption in a really interesting way. I think it's not out of the question that we're going to come out of this with some coherence that's going to last a long time with a different coalition of about 60% of the country moving in a similar direction. And it's not unprecedented, because in fact, this is exactly what happened the last time we did a reinvention. And if you go back to this period, the politics worked like this. Essentially, this is essentially John Maynard Keynes, actually. And this is a quote I actually want to just say here, because it'll put it in context what's happening here, folks. He wrote this in the beginning of the Depression, 1930, just early days of progression, except of the Depression. He said, we're suffering just now from a bad attack of economic pessimism. It is common to hear people say that the epoch of enormous economic progress which characterized the 19th century is over, that the rapid improvement in the standard of life is now going to slow down, at least at any rate in Great Britain, which at that time was the leading country in the world, um, that a decline in prosperity is more likely than an improvement in the decade which lies ahead of us. That was the common perception of that. He said, I believe that this is a wildly mistaken interpretation of what is happening to us. We are suffering not from the rheumatics, the rheumatics of old age, but from the growing pains of over-rapid changes, from the painfulness of readjustment between one economic period and another. In fact, he was totally right. And coming basically out of the Great Depression, World War II, there was a, essentially a 50-year run both in the United States and in Europe, of essentially a different way of running the economy, a different way of organizing the world, a different way of kind of building a society. I actually think there's a lot of parallels potentially here. I don't know exactly how it'll play out, but it's something to be thinking about. They had their level of their big challenges. You know, they had their Great Depression, they had their financial crash, they had their basically nuclear war, they had nuclear war, they had no idea how to basically uh, Hitler and, you know, communist nuclear war, they had no idea how to do, that was their climate change. They didn't know how to do nuclear war. They started out clueless. They had no idea. But all you can do is take the technology of your time, the human resources of your time. Every time we've done in American history, we've done this kind of thing yet again. It's the only thing you can do to come up with solutions, basically. Human resources, available technology solutions. At that time, you know, a bunch of Old white guys with some chalk in a room, right? This is, the, uh, this is actually the chief uh, scientific officer of uh, Vannevar Bush, who first saw the potential of a World Wide Web. We only used h half of our population. You know, we had the tools of like, because you know, women were not fully utilized like they could have been back then. And yet we did this crazy thing. We basically pulled the whole you know, world out of kind of uh, the Great Depression with a different kind of economics. We basically Saved the world from fascism, got a nuclear balance going. We haven't um, dropped for 70 years. Uh, we built United Nations, IMF, World Bank, whole cloth within three years. GI Bill, all this stuff domestically to build out a middle class. And we look back on these folks and we say, oh my god, these people are amazing. How'd they do that? Well, they're no different than us, folks. They really are no different than us. We just can't see all the crazy new characters. We don't understand with any perspective. We have all the human resources and particularly all the technologies we want. I mean, just to, final, to finish up here, what if you went to FDR and you said, hey, FDR, 
I got this thing here that you can ask any question in the world and get all the world's information back to you prioritized in a second. He would have looked at you and said, that's magic. And we'd say, no, no, it's Google. And uh, every five-year-old in the country knows how to work it. Like, it's like, it's Google. It's like we are totally able to make this transition to this totally digital world. We are completely able to make this in transition to this totally integrated global society. We are completely able to move to clean energy and all this kind of sustainable society. And I will tell you, in 50, 100, 500 years from now, people will look back in the early 21st century and they'll say, ah, that's when the world went digital, that's when the world went global, that's when the world went sustainable, that's when America reinvented itself one last time and actually led the world into this new age. And with that, I'd say, thank you. And we're pushing 8 o'clock here. I don't want to keep people from their drinks there too far, but we probably have time. For, I don't know. Take some questions. Take a couple questions. If people have to run, they have to run. But uh, a lot we had to get out there, but it was, uh, hopefully stretch your thinking a little bit for this conference. You want to take a question? Yeah, I'm happy to take a question. Go ahead. Could you put back the, uh, the graph of, the, of wages? The, the wages one? Yes. Uh, which wage is one? There are several wages. What? About, do we just explain what it is, and I'll talk. Well, what, what wages were going up until Ronald Reagan, and then they went flat. Yeah, household median income. Yes. What about that? Yes. Yeah, so I grew up before that. Back when actually uh, University of California was tuition was zero, and um, uh huh. Like a city. City College in New York tuition was zero. Is that like now? Uh huh. Anyway, what was happening was that was until until Reagan, the wages were going up with the productivity, and then there was the implementation of the Lewis Powell Randall to stop it, and it was the. Uh, anti-worker and anti-union activities of Ronald Reagan and then uh, NAFTA of, of, of Clinton, which resulted in, in, in the flat part uh, as opposed okay. to going up. And so it's likely that the, the politics now will continue with things going, with medium family income staying flat as productivity keeps going up as you well, this is, I, I, I put this out here just because this is a fact. No one can de dispute these facts. This is true. The interpretation of what happened here can differ. You have one idea there, which I think is a, a good one. Uh, there's a lot of things happened here, though, uh, beyond just policy, too. But, uh, for example, the computer stuff in here and different ways of doing work and manufacturing was kind of went abroad and all kinds of stuff happened. But I will say, absolutely, and I just want, I'm putting this information out here not to give the comprehensive final idea on this, just keep it thinking. And I will say, particularly with AI and all kind of exacerbating this thing, there's going to be something around income distribution or kind of wealth, recalibration of wealth in this country and in, in the West. And I think it's, uh, it's just something you've got to wrap your head around. Because I think, I think it'd be foolish not to understand that that's some, this is building to a point where something has to shift. And historically speaking, when things like that happens, things do shift. Another question there at the back? Oh. Yeah. Um, oh, then, then you too. I'm curious. Um, so, um, education, um, and, and if I'm wrong, correct me. But it sounds to me like a lot of your assumptions or these trends are global and irreversible. And um, I wonder if you could address that. I mean, one of the things we know is things are reversible. And um, the second thing I would ask is. Your presentation was um, descriptive, and I'm wondering for us, um, many of I think maybe all of us who agree with a lot of your point of view. Um, but what are your policy prescriptions? I mean, what if these trends are reversible? What if the, the political responses are not um, as positive as you have presented? What would you recommend for all of us to try to make sure that they are positive? Good question. Um, let me, let me just say this. Um, 
No, nothing is inevitable. I, I want to be very clear. When I lay out, well, well, I shouldn't say that. Some things I think are inevitable. I do think the spread of core internet technologies and basic computer technologies are going to be extremely hard to stop in any kind of comprehensive way. On the other hand, we're watching how China is able to use kind of censorship with using internet technologies. And, you know, and again, things that I thought were inevitable in our growing politics here, we saw in the last election a very different backlash and all kinds of things are unwinding. So clearly it's not some singular way forward that's just going to be smooth. So I'm not too foolish to say that. But I will say this, and this is part of the reason I'm laying this out here, is it's also not right to get trapped in the current situation and not see the big picture of the long term through lines of what is probably going to happen. And also, once you understand what's happening like that, I think there's ways to organize and think around that and kind of strategically think about that. If you're talking, and this is why I'm talking to you guys in the beginning of a conference here, if you're talking about long-range planning for this region, do not think that what's happening right now in the last two years here around their politics is essentially how this is going to play out. And I would say, I would be very careful about revamping anything around this. I would say keep the through lines. Now in terms of specific policy prescriptions, I mean that's a whole other lecture. We can go to, into it. And I don't have all the answers. But I do have some general directions here. And I will say one thing. This is one of the things I say about California. The reason that California is interesting is not, I'm just not a chauvinist about California. But California is further along in this process. And they've essentially adapted to that paralyzed process and, uh, of politics and rooted around it. And they're kind of going back to other things that were seem to be discredited previously. They're raising taxes, progressive taxation. They're putting, just put a 13, 14% tax on gasoline. Like, you know, what other states doing that? Uh, I mean, there's, but, but people are, you know, are not rebelling. I mean, we're, we're doing, there's things that are happening that are just counter to what's happening. And I think it just makes you think, ah, that policy prescription, that's not, a third rail that you can't touch. Or that is something that maybe is going to come back in other states. And anyhow, it's just, it's just ways that without getting didactic about everything happening, keep an eye on that. Also, it's not just California. I would say look at urban hubs, at, even in Texas. I mean, Texas, the Senate race in Texas is getting competitive here, folks. That has the same immigration same, uh, things going on as California. I mean, sh stuff that we thought would never happen is starting to happen. And what we know from Trump is that stuff can move, things that we never thought would happen can happen fast, and when they happen, they can have big implications. They can be, depending on your politics, positive or negative, but um, hold on for the ride, because these periods, but the one thing I wanted to say about every one of those periods, every one of these transitions began with extremely polarized politics. I mean, we had a civil war in, eight, you know, Lincoln was shot, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was shot, you know, uh, uh, FDR was a traitor to his class, right? I mean, these moments are high stakes. There's a lot of skin in the game. There's whole industries will go down. There's whole industries going up. This is not a time for, you know, it, it's, it's people get, you know, they're, they're intense times. And we're just feeling that right now. And we're not fully realizing how fundamental the, the battle is, essentially, around where the future of the country is going. That's what I would say. Uh, and in all due respect to both sides, I'm just saying, we've worked it out before, we've figured it out. Both parties has, have actually been influential in these junctures, Republicans, Democrats. We just got to figure it out this time of where, how we're going to figure this out, folks, because it ain't working. Anyhow, this is more for having a drink afterwards, maybe, Taka. Uh, but anyhow, that's what we've got the back here. Yeah, go ahead. Community and culture. Say one more time when you say. Realm, which yeah. As planners, we are very, very interested in community and culture. Well, what I would, if I think I'm hearing you right, here's what I would say. Just like I said, to keep an eye on the uh, Californians, some certain things, keep an eye on the millennials. Is like what's been astounding is how they're moving this in the urban centers. They're living together. They're raising, starting to raise families now in much more densely populated kind of situations. Um, they're, they're not buying cars. Uh, they're, you know, sharing vehicles. They're into the sharing economy. Um, you know, community, community, community. I mean, it's community squared, right? And uh, people want to work in coffee shops, we're, we're common work. You know, nobody wants to sit in their own bedroom in, you know, their office. They don't want to be in a coffee shop with a million other people. There is a cultural thing happening, and it's young and vibrant and millennial. It's also diverse, 
and it's also, you know, all kind of high tech. There's a lot of attributes. Just study that generation, and that's the future where the country's going. Don't study, uh, uh, and, and the younger generation is too young to see, but, you know, they seem to be cut in the same cloth with coming out of this whole gun control stuff and things, too. So, anyhow, it's an interesting time, but I would say I don't have all the answers. Just look to these leading indicators and uh, study it closely. And I know we got to get going. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the bear side of the bull side. So the negative effects and how yeah. to regulate how to regulate Silicon Valley and yeah. um, in terms of like AI, drone warfare, um, yeah. giving AI rights, who yeah. claims responsibility if yeah. artificial intelligence. Got it. Did everybody hear that or I just do the brief? This thing is like, what's the flip side, the other side of the tech, you know, positive tech stuff? There's all this negative stuff. What about regulating Silicon Valley? You know, what are the kind of things that we got to do now? I would say totally right in, you know, the time we had here, we couldn't do the whole thing. This is what's happening. Just like in the early 20th century, you watch the rise of these giant companies coming off of, you know, AT&T and, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, Edison and all, all these new companies that got extremely, and the robber barons and, you know, Carnegie Steel and all kinds of stuff that was coming late 19th century. There was a big reaction to that. It was like we have to deal with that in new ways. I would say tech, which was this, this young little fledgling industry 20 years ago, is now the commanding heights of the global economy now is the time the society weighs in. We have to start thinking about how do we collectively kind of constrain this? How does it actually do work? And I think they're ready to do that. And I think they're more open than you think. I don't think tech is wants to kind of squeeze the juice out of this. I think they're horrified about some of the implications that are happening. And they want to they wanna be the good guys on this too as best they can. Now, we can debate that, but I will say yes. Now we're entering the period of like, okay, they've grown up. Now how do we deal with this as a society? What do we make choices together? And what are the limits? How do we channel a lot of this back into society? Potentially different taxing, potentially different regulations, potentially different breaking them up. A lot of people are thinking some of these companies might have to get broken up differently. Um, we're in that game now. Just like every time this has happened, you get to that point, we're in that point. And I think everyone's trying to understand that. Yeah, one, this guy's been standing up, and then we're going to go get a drink here. And I'm, I'm going to be here for the next hour, so hang out. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, where would you predict that AI is going to be in the future? Is that going to be more, or not AI, I'm sorry, cybersecurity, is that going to be more driven by AI or people? Well, um, does everyone get that point? Here, here's what I'd say. Cybersecurity, yes, at, in a world that is totally digital and completely interconnected across the entire planet, the way I described, everyone's going to have this. Security is going to be a huge, huge thing. And without getting too geeky here, I will say one of the things that's happening around this discussion around blockchain, for those that it's a whole different world here, but there's a, there's a layer of the, of, there's, there's a few missing pieces of the existing internet that weren't developed in the 90s that could have been and should have been, one of which had to do with privacy, um, security, and uh, ensuring trusted parties can operate, through, w w trusting the information that gets passed around. Anyhow, the long and short of it is, you hear this word, chain, essentially think of it as a new internet protocol that's being layered over the old internet and is essentially to solve these problems around security and, and uh, crypt cryptography and privacy that essentially is in the early stages. Think of it as where the web was in 1995 when they're still trying to figure out well, how is the web going to work and how are we going to, at Wired we had to figure out how do you do a banner ad, who, how does a person comment on a story. Uh, who, how can you sign in membership? How do, everything else. There's that level of blockchain is right now. When that happens, though, I think it's going to essentially enable another level 
of security and confidence in a lot of these transactions and a lot of these things, and also a sense that you will own your data in a way that right now, you know, Facebook has some, Google has some, no one knows where the hell it is. There's another regime that's getting worked out in the next five years around blockchain without getting too, there's stuff about blockchain that's wacky too, and don't get too sucked into it, but there's a real fundamental discussion going on now, essentially of making the internet infrastructure that it's got to be for the rest of the century. Some of that is to do with those key things that you raised, including security, uh, around cybersecurity. So yes, it's a growth industry. If you want to do it, get, your, get, get a degree in that. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's a growth thing. But anyhow, I think, folks, you've been a great audience. We spent a lot of time here. And I think, but I'm going to be here, and we can chat. And uh, so before, appreciate it. Before we thank the speaker, I'm going to remind you, we're going to have a reception right now. So if you want to corner him and ask him a really hard question. <laughs>